chair and presenter. Ah, yes, when you are double, so it's equal. <laughs> yeah. No, the, the number of participants now exceeds the, uh, the number of presenters. So I will ask uh, Gianluca to share his screen and uh, go ahead with uh, discussing looking for a genuine science of politics. William Schreiker and the game theoretical turn in political science. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, let me... And I will ask everyone except the presenter to please... Okay. Okay, let's start. Uh, one moment that I... Okay, okay, start. Uh, thanks for the, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to discuss my paper. This is a... Uh, 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 the most recent version of a paper that I discussed previously in other occasions, um, for instance, uh, the Friday meeting at the, at the Center for the History of Political Economy at Duke, but also at the Ashton Summer School. So in this paper, I put some of the feedbacks that I received in, that, okay, in, in those occasions. Um, this paper is also part of my PhD dissertation. The, I am currently working on the history of how uh, gain theory entered into political science. And my focus is especially on um, William Riker, that uh, was uh, uh, perhaps the most important uh, uh, American political scientist who was uh, uh, very committed to the uh, employment of gain theory into political science. And Riker also established this, uh, this uh, subfield, this research field of political science that is called the positive political theory that was uh, deeply committed to mathematical, formula, to mathematical modeling and gain theory. Uh, I start with uh, I started my paper with this quotation that is taken directly from a Riker most important work that a work that I will discuss briefly in the last part of my paper that is the theory of political coalition in the in the theory of political coalitions in that work uh, Riker wrote that to him the main hope for a genuine science of politics lies in the discovery and use of an adequate model of political behavior. And this is record it was very explicit about uh, what uh, his aims were. And uh, for him, uh, this, uh, this model of political behavior was offered by gain theory. So in, the, in that work, as I will show, he used for Norman and Morgenstern a theory of uh, coalition theory, um, cooperative gain theory, to, uh, uh, to, create, to elaborate a model of political coalitions. My paper is an historical paper, so um, my the history that uh, the nar my narrative is uh, uh, is bounded by two uh, concurrent uh, histories. That is uh, one of the, is the development of the mathematical economics in America, um, especially after the publication of Theory of Gains and Economic Behavior in uh, 1944. The other story is that of behavioral revolution in political science. Um, in the in the fifties, especially in the fifth from the fifties onward, in political science there were uh, many young scholars that were uh, uh, that develop some kind of hostility toward the more traditional approaches in political science. The more traditional approaches are the historical approach, the juridical approach, and instead they strive for a more quantitative political theory, a more statistical based political theory. It is interesting because Riker shared many. Uh, many, many views with the behavioralist, but at the same time, he did not join the behavioral movement. He remained more uh, committed to his own idea of uh, his own theoretical agenda uh, for political science that were more uh, focused on the employment of gain theory. The behavioralists were not, uh, uh, they, they were not pursuing uh, an economic type modeling. Instead, Riker was more focused on gain theory. Um, in, my paper is, uh, is divided as follows. Uh, in the first part, I present uh, Riker's life uh, very briefly with uh, also some words about his, uh, his early academic experience. In the second part, I will just, I, I'm going to discuss uh, um, uh, some example of formal political theory in the 50s. In the third part, instead, I will present the content of Riker's theory of political coalition that, as I said before, is. Uh, is this most famous, important and this most ambitious work. Finally, in the last part, I will uh, try to uh, discuss briefly some um, 
some ideas concerning uh, Riker's uh, relationship, the relationship between uh, Riker's ideas and the economic ideas he used. So let's start with Riker's life. Um, this is a photo of Riker at Rochester. Um, Riker was born in Iowa in the 1920. He, he grew up in Indiana and he attended uh, as an undergraduate student at the DePaul University. And after that, he, he enrolled at Harvard. Um, he enrolled at Harvard in the late 40s uh, in the Harvard Graduate School in uh, Political Science. And uh, at Harvard, uh, he developed some kind of hostility toward the mainstream methodology in American political science that he identified with the two main, uh, uh, main uh, methodological, uh, with the two uh, main methodologies. One was the case study approach and the other one was the history of political ideas approach. Uh, Riker was uh, equally hostile toward both of them because they lacked uh, the generality for, uh, for uh, uh, offering, for presenting a, a valid explanation of political behavior. Um, as I said before, these, uh, these, uh, these concerns were shared also by the so-called behavioralist. Uh, also at Harvard, for instance, uh, one of the one of the, uh, the fellow with the Riker at the graduate school was David Easton, that was a, most, a very famous political scientist in the 50s. He was one of the main proponent of the behavioral revolution, and he was very critical for of what he defined the historicist attitude of, of American political science. But anyway, Riker was not really a behavioralist, and instead, as I said, he preferred to push, to push a, a, personal, a personal agenda, a personal theoretical agenda, a personal theoretical idea of what of political science. Um, my main source for, 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 uh, for this reconstruction of Riker's life was an interview that he gave to Ken Shepsle. Shepsle is, a, is a, still alive, he's a political scientist, is, and he, he, was, uh, he, he was a scholar of Riker, he was a student of Riker at Rochester. And um, Riker gave this uh, very long interview for the oral history program of uh, political science. Um, in this interview, he reconstructed his, his experience at Harvard. And in this interview, he, said, he, he gave also um, this, uh, this, this judgment of, of von Neumann and Morgenstern. He, he said that he became acquainted with the von Neumann and Morgenstern book, The Theory of Gains and Economic Behavior in the, in the second half of the 50s. And there he found what I thought that political science needed for constructive theory. Uh, this is important also because the Riker theory of political coalition, as I will show, uh, is, very is really based on phenomenon and Morgenstern idea, is really based on phenomenon and Morgenstern idea of solution, that is the stable set, and phenomenon and Morgenstern approach, that is the cooperative game theory. In the, in the late 50s, uh, there were other works that influenced uh, uh, Riker, uh, for instance, the work of Auro about social choice, the work of Chaplin Schubik about uh, the distribution of power in a committee. This work is, uh, is extremely important, is extremely original because as I will uh, say very briefly, um, this was an attempt, an orig a very original attempt to employ game theory, cooperative game theory to address a traditional political issue that is the issue of power. In uh, the 60, 1960s, 1961, Riker, uh, uh, was a fellow at Stanford where there, where, uh, there, was, uh, the, there was the Center for the Advanced Study of Behavioral Science. And at Stanford, uh, Riker met, uh, uh, for instance, Canaro that was there. Um, and at Stanford, he also uh, worked on, on his work of on political coalitions that was published in 1962. And in the same year, the 1962, Riker was a appointed uh, as a professor of political science at Rochester. And this is very important because at Rochester, Riker established uh, an advanced a PhD program in political science uh, that uh, centered around uh, mathematical modeling, formal modeling and theory and so on. But the story of how Riker established this, uh, this program is not part of my paper. So my reconstruction of Riker's life stops here. Uh, now I briefly turn my attention to what, uh, to other kind of, mod of formal modeling of politics in the 50s. Um, 
in the 50s, alongside the mathematical, the, the development of mathematical economics, there were some attempts to extend the same kind of um, uh, exact reasoning also to model to political issues. Um, first of all, I outlined uh, some different uh, names for uh, these. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this approach. Um, as I said, uh, Riker uh, Lablet is, uh, is a research field as a positive political theory. This uh, came uh, in, the, in the 60s or 70s. And also another name that is often used is also that of public choice. There were some different, there are some difference between positive political theory and public choice in my view, but uh, the, these differences are not addressed in my paper. Uh, also, another, um, another author that was, done, was Duncan Black, uh, he, he spoke about uh, a poor science of politics. Uh, also, Tallock, uh, Gordon Tallock talked about uh, a strict science of politics. Anyway, all these, uh, these labels um, are uh, many common features that is are, fo are formal, use model, use formal modeling for political, for political, uh, for political problems and also are based on uh, rational individual choice. Uh, very, very few, few words about what are the two main strengths of, of formal political theories in the 50s. There was social choice uh, with Arrow. There was also Black with uh, shared with Arrow many uh, common views about some themes, but uh, Black is not really, not really a social choice theorist, strictly speaking. And there was also Anthony Downs uh, with his uh, economic theory, with his uh, the economic theory of democracy. And on the other side, there was gain theory, um, especially cooperative gain theory was the most original, offered the most original contribution that, as I said before, was the Shapley Shubik index that was based on the Shapley value for in person cooperative gains. Um, now, uh, I want to discuss briefly. Uh, 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 the, the content of Riker's work about political coalitions, so that is uh, the, the theory of political coalitions. This is a very ambitious work uh, that, uh, on which Riker worked in the late 50s, early 60s, and that was published by Yale University Press in the 1962. Um, his book is, div is divided, I would say, in two parts. In the first part, the, the, the author uh, discuss uh, how, how political actors create coalitions and uh, discuss what is uh, the mo his most famous contribute, contributions, that is uh, the size principle. In the second part, Riker instead tried to elaborate a, a dynamic model of coalition building, uh, focusing on strategic consideration uh, and um, Equally important, also I would say also most, more important perhaps is also the first chapter of the book where I can discuss the methodological uh, aspects of, of his model, but he also discuss, uh, also he defended this methodological view concerning a rational, uh, a formal approach in political science. Uh, it must be noted that the Riker work is not a mathematical work. Riker was not a mathematician, and he used he rested heavily on uh, on again theoretical notions, but sometimes uh, he used these uh, these ideas in in an unsophisticated manner, also especially from a mathematical point of view. Anyway. Before to discuss the con very briefly the, the content of the content of Riker's work. I um, I try to I try to reconstruct uh, the the relationship, if any, between Riker and Gain theories in the fifties. Um, Gain theory community in the fifties was uh, mainly made up by uh, mathematicians, uh, not not much economists. This is uh, uh, a non history. Um, Mathematicians were divided I mean, between uh, Princeton Mathematics Department and also RAND Corporation. At RAND, uh, there, were, there, were, there was much attention of applied gain theory, but also on theoretical aspects of it. Uh, in, in the community of gain theory, Riker was quite an outsider because, as I said, he was not a mathematician and he lacked the, the necessary mathematical capabilities to uh, develop uh, new new theorems or new theories of for what concerns gain theory. But I think also that uh, he was not really a member of the, the, the gain theory community because he was uh, pursuing his, uh, his, uh, his own political agenda, his own intellectual agenda that uh, did not fit really well with uh, the aims of gain theorists, especially at Princeton, but also at Rand. Um, 
I found an interesting insights uh, about these trends and relationship between the Riker and game theorists in the, in the Morgenstern paper, where Riker sent uh, the manuscript of uh, theory of political collision to Morgenstern at Princeton, uh, and Morgenstern actually rebuffed it, uh, saying that it was not a great work about game theory, it was too much unsophisticated. In the same time, Riker sent his manuscript also to, Mark, to Yale University Press. Yale University Press sent the manuscript to Martin Schubick for a referee, and Martin Schubick was more, uh, more supportive. At, at the end, the manuscript was published. A few words about uh, Riker's model. Uh, Riker's devoted some space on, um, on discussing the, the assumption of his model that are rationality and zero sum especially on rationality, uh, but I will say something at the end. Um, what is must be noted now is that Riker was critical toward the idea of, the, I would say the tautological argument concerning rationality advanced by economists. Uh, and instead he, 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 was, he, he proposed an idea, a substantive idea of rationality based on, on the idea of the preference for losing or for winning over losing. For what concern uh, is theor the theoretical content of his work, uh, um, his most famous uh, uh, outcome is that is the so-called size principle that is um, um, that can be summed up as the smaller the size of a collision, the higher its the higher its payoff at as long as this collision remains a winning collision. So um, to this uh, principle, this is a sociological principle, it's not a mathematical theorem, uh, but from this principle uh, can be derived a statement that uh, is uh, about in M person zero sum game where sub payments are permitted and where players are rational and where players have perf a perfect information, only minimum winning collision occur. Uh, Riker insisted uh, uh, much on the fact that this principle uh, could be verified uh, in the real world politics. And uh, from, uh, for, for this uh, verification process, he, used, uh, he, adopt, he looked through pages of American history, he adopted uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, instrumentalist argument. So he saw, for instance, uh, um, in, the, in the 19th century American politics, for instance, when the Democratic Party, when the Republican, the Democratic Republican Party broke uh, and the Democratic Party was founded as an example of um, trying to develop a, minim a minimum winning coalition from a coalition of the war, um, or of, the, of the wall that was represented by the Democratic Republican Party. Uh, his argument is instrumentalist because he follow uh, some kind of as if logic that is obviously uh, even if uh, the, the, American, the American political leaders in the 19th century were not strictly following the size principle, they behave as if they were following it. So uh, the second part is devoted to the strategy of coalition building. Um, this, is the, this part is quite fascinating, but is also the weakest part of Riker's analysis. Uh, in this part, Riker tried to develop a model where political leaders offer, uh, offer uh, side payments to uh, add the, the size of a coalition and also uh, make strategic, move, strategic moves to expel members from a coalition. Um, um, in this part, uh, Riker was in this, these pages. These pages, uh, Riker ambitious, uh, Riker's ambitions are not really fulfilled uh, because, as I will uh, say in the last part, uh, I think that he simply lacked the, the game theoretical notions uh, in order to to advance uh, to advance uh, this uh, this this model to to to, um, to advance this model. Um, so uh, to conclude uh, um, this brief presentation, um, um, in this, in this uh, last session, I want uh, to uh, briefly discuss uh, some topic of uh, uh, Riker's employment of, economics, of economic theory, focusing on rationality, game theory, and the idea of equilibrium. Uh, first of all, an historical note, uh, Riker's work was not reviewed by game theorists. It was practically ignored by them. Uh, it was reviewed by, by some political scientists, but the political scientists who review uh, the theory of political coalitions focus on very general themes, none of, the, none of, 
none of them entered in the details of his gain theoretical analysis. Um, so uh, um, let's uh, focus now on uh, Riker use of economic and gain theory ideas. Um, I focus, as I said, on three aspects that are rationality, gain theory, and equilibrium. Starting with equilibrium, Riker talked extensively about equilibrium in his, uh, in his uh, theory of political coalitions, but it seems to me that Riker's idea of economics was a little bit uh, out of date, or, or better, I'm using now, I'm in, this, I'm, I'm in this interpretation, I'm using the idea developed by uh, Zoccoli about of concerning the development, the change of economics between 1930s and 1950s as a, as a moving uh, from uh, an idea of economics as a, as a system of force toward an idea of economics as a system of relations where the, the second, oops, the time is out, uh, where the second is, uh, is related to um, mathematical economics as now, as we now, it, with, as, as, as we now uh, interpret it. And the, the first one is related to economics in the, to, I would say, neoclassical marginal economics, marginalist economics. Um, uh, in, in this idea, um, the, the notion of equilibrium is very important, uh, but it seems to me that it's important, is equally important also the notion of disequilibrium and the Riker in this work put much emphasis also on the notion of disequilibrium. So uh, his idea concerning uh, economics and concerning equ equilibrium is not the idea uh, of gain theory or the idea of mathematical economics concerning the, the existence of equilibrium. So for me, in my view, uh, I try to uh, explain in my paper because in my view, uh, Riker was more related to an outdated, uh, uh, I would say quite uh, outdated vision of economics. The, for what concerns rationality, as I said, uh, if seen, it, it seems to me that Riker's argument is quite flawed because he, he, he proposes a, a substantive view of rationality, but also in that case, uh, he, he, he presented some kind of contradiction between a substantive view and a preference and a tautological view of rationality that is not entirely correct from my point of view. And finally, for what concerns again theory, and this is the last part, the last, the very last part of my presentation. Uh, for what concerns again theory, especially in the in the last part, in the in the, in the, in the part where Riker presented a dynamic model of game theory, he is very ambitious and he, he, oops, sorry. Wrong slide. Um, especially uh, Riker uh, foresaw some of the developments of game theory in my view because he, he advanced some kind of proposal that has some resemblance with what uh, with, with, with what uh, be, will became the so-called Nash, Nash program that is the strategic foundation of, of the non-cooperative foundation of cooperative gains. But also in, the, in that case, because it seems to me that uh, reading Riker's model is, is it is a bargain model. But in that case, also in that case, uh, um, the theoretical notions that uh, were necessary to develop to fully develop that this uh, that, that model was uh, was beyond uh, Riker's reach in the in the early sixties. So his model he, he foresaw the possible development of game theory, but wasn't able to push with that to push with them this, uh, this, 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 this development. So, okay, I conclude. Um... Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gian Gianluca. Uh, we are going to be having discussion at the end of the three papers, because given the topics of the papers, many of the uh, questions or comments might uh, relate to more than one paper. Uh, so, uh, Catherine, uh, Hafeld is, is next, and I'll ask her to share her screen. And I'll ask everyone except the speaker to please. So can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. OK. Hear you. OK, great. So thanks very much. Um, this is, um, I should say, collaborative work, the, the paper that I'm going to present with um, Malte Dürne, who is a sociologist here also at the University of Zürich, where I'm also at. And we um, base this paper on previous work that we have done. And in this um, previous work uh, we have done together, we looked at um, 
the history of rational choice theories, um, and particularly uh, on the we we analyze the diffusion of gain theoretic and um, decision the theoretic models across the social and behavioral sciences in the 20th century, or in the second half of the 20th century, and the general. Um, objective of this project is really to understand how those kinds of rational choice models were adopted not only in economics but more widely also in other disciplines so that they could spread uh, accordingly to all kinds of different scientific communities and fields. So in our previous work we tried to identify different roles that scientists and uh, the contributions of scientists can play in enabling the diffusion of rational choice theories. And in this analysis, we identified uh, four different roles that such scientific contributions can play. Uh, we labeled them the innovative role, who come up with a, you know, a, a novel uh, idea, in our case, uh, rational choice theories, people then who elaborate on those novel ideas, people then who translate these ideas to make them applicable into to new domains, and then people, the specialists, uh, who actually apply them, these new ideas, in our case, rational choice theories, to particular problems in, in, the, in these specialized uh, domains or different disciplines. Um, so what we noticed, however, when we came up with this role typology in this analysis was that the spread of rational choice theories, and particularly in the early adoption period, when you look at the period um, in which they were trans from say mathematics into economics, those roles could not fully explain uh, the different, uh, you know, the, 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 this adoption process. And more specifically, we wondered when we did this kind of research, what the role of administrative staff and other, what we call neglected individuals might have been in enabling and pushing the adoption of rational choice theories. And we wanted to now better understand the roles that such scholars meaning scholars that don't make the, you know, the big uh, scientific contributions to elaborate or translate rational choice theories, um, uh, what role they, they played and um, maybe, and whether or not we can actually make these roles more specific. Um, so by talking about neglected individuals, we wanted to sh shift the focus a little bit away from scientists um, who make these fundamental contributions, more towards people who are also play different kinds of roles, for example, by having a particular powerful, you know, uh, roles at specific research institutions and so forth, being administrative leaders and so forth. And we focus because um, rational choice theories first were adopted at the Coast Commission, we focus on the Coast Commission in looking into these, this particular, um, these particular kinds of roles that scientists might, or, you know, scholars might play. Um, of course, the innovator behind rational choice theories were was John von Neumann, Oskar Morgenstern, their book, The Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, and the innovative contributions, as you all know, but I mentioned them anyway, uh, were of course twofold. First, the axiomatic formulation of the expected utility principle, and second, the minimax criterion and other um, you know, game schemes to theorize about strategic interaction between uh, agents. And both contributions were quickly taken up in different fields, but they were first adopted in economics. However, it was not that both contributions were taken up to the same extent. And of course, people who are here in the session uh, have worked on this quite a bit. So although um, the first discussion circulated around game theory, for example, if you look at the reviews that the book pre, um, follow, was followed by, it was more uh, quickly that expected utility uh, theory was taken up by economists. And several explanations have, have been given in the literature to uh, explain this early adoption of expected utility theory and the later adoption of game theory. Um, by, for example, of course, Robert Diamond and Nicola Giocoli, uh, such as, for example, that economists did not yet commit to an image of science um, from mathematics that was required to see uh, particularly the value of game theory, or and second, that new mathematical tools that von Norman Morgenstern had introduced were really too challenging, too new for the average economist to immediately take up game theory. And also that it was initially not fully clear um, what the, these kinds of abstract mathematical theories could offer to the social sciences. And uh, expect utility theory was, of course, something that economists all, already knew. And I think those explanations are in large part um, 
uh, explaining, uh, of course, the asymmetry and adoption between expected utility theory and game theory. However, maybe this focus on the, these neglected individuals might also partly explain why expected utility theory was uh, more quick or quicker taken up at the Coles Commission rather than um, game theoretic models. And I'm particularly focusing here on the role and effort of Jakob Marshak in his role as an administratively central figure at Coles, of course, as he was the director at the period that we're looking at. So um, the departure point then uh, that we start from is that these administrative leaders such as, um, uh, such as Marshak, um, who was director at the Coast Commission would play a crucial role in the adoption process, not only by making himself, of course, scholarly contributions to further develop expected utility theory, of which he was very fond. Rather, he and also Koopmans particularly played particularly structural roles that were different from the scientists that were also engaged with, um, with the contributions that von Neumann Morgenstern made, such as people like Simon, Debreu, Markowitz, Horwitz, who were at the Coast Commission, but played different kinds of roles, I would say, namely as scientists, more in these translator, elaborator roles that I mentioned before, than uh, in, in terms of administrative roles. So the question that we want to ask in this paper is really, what role did they play in the diffusion process, these administrative leaders, and in particular Marshak, and how can this role be characterized in a more systematic way? And the claim that we uh, that I want to support here in this paper is that they, Marshak uh, in particular played a crucial role in enabling this diffusion process, particularly of expected utility theory, by occupying what uh, we call an academic opinion leader, and we take here the uh, terminology from the diffusion of innovations literature, um, um, and those are the kinds of individuals uh, for, for, to which others go to seek advice or information or feedback and so forth. And also, he played this. Uh, he played a crucial role by directing topical emphasis and pushing research agendas, uh, particularly on expected utility theory, through his own work, but also via extensive exposure and feedback at the Coles Commission to to the people who were uh, uh, around. So, um, in a nutshell, he basically motivated all these great. Um, um, you know, people like Debra, Simon, Markowitz, Horvitz, and so forth, to make these, these scientific contributions they ultimately made. Um, so the method that we are going to, what we're using in this paper is um, uh, to, to study these structural differences between um, these kinds of roles that I'm mentioning, but also to characterize the roles of an the role of an academic opinion leader a bit more systematically, uh, we use the method of block modeling. That's a method that allows us to analyze social networks by allowing the actors in the network um, uh, to be grouped uh, um, according to the similarities of the relations that they have to others, and that can be thought of as occupying similar roles in that network. And um, this method allows us to first differentiate between people according to the roles that they take in a scientific community, say at an institution like the Coast Commission, but also thereby allows, this method allows us um, to reveal informational uh, or informal social hierarchies at a particular institution, uh, for example, at the Coast Commission. So not only can we differentiate uh, different people according to their roles, but also thereby reveal a a kind of informal hierarchy uh, in the community that these people are part of. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a minute. So the data set that we use is to um, is acknowledgments uh, data that we take from reprints and pr discussion papers written at the Coast Commission between 1944 and 1955 until the Coast Commission uh, moved to Yale from Chicago. And the novelty of this approach is really the kind of data that we use uh, or analyze, namely the acknowledgement data. And of course, we can discuss later on because there are also all sorts of problems with that data. Um, data set, um, uh, um, you know, what kind of limitations you see here uh, to answer our question. So let me quickly say before I go into the analysis something about uh, acknowledgements, uh, what we think they signal as, a, as a in terms of relations between people. 
Um, of course, acknowledgements are useful to see how social structures we think evolve in a community, say, for example, at the Coast Commission. And this is because acknowledgements can signal how actors can influence the adoption of an idea. Um, by, for example, them people writing and publishing on something that they seek advice on. Uh, so they acknowledge someone that they get advice from on a particular idea. Um, and this is, of course, when they acknowledge someone or by giving feedback on papers and thereby push an agenda or point into a certain direction of a person who works on a on a topic and I would I would give feedback and say well why don't you look at, at expected utility theory it might give you some kind of you know solution for the problem that you still have to solve in your paper and this is when I for example become acknowledged so acknowledgements can signal appreciation for all kinds of things but in this in particular uh, also uh, the ways in which people can influence and being influenced um, by others um, they can uh, signal appreciation for receiving feedback on content, on approach, method, data, and so forth, a suggestion for further development of a work, pointers for inspirational references, advice of any sort, of course, also financial support, any other kind of support or dependency relationships. Um, and in that sense, we think that they signal, they potentially signal how people can be influenced by an idea that someone who then gets acknowledged pushed them towards. They differ from citations um, in that they refer to content, but they are not reducible to scientific content, whereas citations are. And um, they can reveal scholars that are central, we think, in a community. In, and they can be central, scholars can be central in two kinds of ways. First, scientifically central, of course. Uh, in that someone who is acknowledged a lot uh, is a pioneering and productive researcher, makes a lot of con scientific contributions, but also, of course, they can signal uh, someone who is institutionally central, being up high up in, a, in an institutional hierarchy, but then also um, by, in virtue of that role, uh, pushing for certain research agendas that this person wants the institution to pursue. Uh, so I think uh, acknowledgments signal both kinds of influences and uh, can as such be taken to reveal parts of a community's informal social structure. Um, so what was our data set when we analyzed acknowledgments relations? So we started from the Coles um, Commission uh, reprints and discussion paper series. We started first to look at um, a period between 1944 and 1970. And in our analysis, we focused on two interrelated aspects that we wanted to extract from those papers. First, of course, of course the acknowledgements. And then second, which papers were actually citing the theory of games and economic behavior, because we were interested in the papers uh, that were um, concerned with the theory of games and economic behavior, while also containing acknowledgements to see who influenced people who worked on that paper um, in taking up the theory of games. Um, so in this period, both series contained 1,094, uh, uh, sorry, 59 uh, papers in total. And we manually examined all those papers for whether they had contained references to the theory of games. And only 101 publications actually cited the theory of games in, as those. Uh, of those, uh, of those, uh, pay, all those papers. And as you can see, the engagement with the theory of games uh, at Coles had a really early high point in the early 1950s, in that 30 out of these um, 192 papers published until 1943 referenced the theory of games and economic behavior. And we also see that Marshak authored more than half of those papers that referenced the theory of games before 1943. Um, sorry, I should have said, of course, what you see here on the slide is the number of publications by year on the secondary axis and the total numbers of publications that reference the theory of games, uh, which is indicated by the vertical black lines and the numbers of papers written by Marshak that, that cited the theory of games which is indicated by the vertical gray lines. Okay, so given that the, the early adoption phase uh, seemed to have occurred until 1955, we limited then ultimately ourselves to that period um, to extract all the acknowledgements relations in those papers to construct an acknowledgement network. Um, here you see the network without going into the details. That's the final outcome uh, that we got. 
And as you can see, it's a, it's a weighted and it's a directed network that shows the direction of the acknowledgements relation, of course, and the numbers of the acknowledgements of one person by another. So the more one person acknowledges one and the same other person, the thicker is you know, the relation between them in the network, the tie. Uh, so the network consists in total of uh, 53 co-authors or authors uh, of in total 162 papers. Uh, who acknowledge 167 individuals in total. And out of these 162 papers, 32, um, which were written by 15 authors only, cite the theory of games and economic behavior. And those papers um, contain acknowledgements to 63 individuals. So these, these details are, of course, not important. And what you can see here, um, on the slide is also an example uh, of the kinds of acknowledgements that we looked at. This one that you see here is just a, a screenshot um, of an acknowledgement that is a, from a paper written by Jakob Marshak and William Andrews. And it just illustrates the different ways in which acknowledgement, acknowledgements can express social relations um, between authors and acknowledged parties. So. Um, I don't read this out loud now, but you can see that people acknowledge others for editing, feedback, proving, providing a proof to actually a paper, uh, giving content-based suggestions, feed, uh, methodological advice, and so forth. So these acknowledgements, they signal uh, quite a, a, a bit, I would say. So here are a few uh, descriptive statistics related to the individuals and the position, their positions in the network. Also, the details are not important here. Also, not all the individuals who occur in the network are listed here on the slide. What is interesting to notice uh, from those numbers is only that Marshak and, of course, also Koopmans are central uh, figures in the network. Uh, Marshak himself uh, engaged in 13 of his publications with the theory of games and economic behavior. And furthermore, he does, as you can see, he does not only have a huge number of incoming acknowledgments, but even more outcoming acknowledgements. So he was acknowledging a lot of people. And according to um, a common centrality measure, uh, which is called eigenvector centrality, is also not important, um, in which in the, it's an indicator for status. Kopans and Mark, Marshak were very high up in, in this hierarchy. So this is something that we get already from very you know, basic um, descriptive statistics. Now, uh, how did we analyze this network now with block modeling? Uh, I, I said before that block modeling is a method to analyze a network with respect to formal and informal role structures um, by revealing the similarities of relations between entities. So the idea is really that we can reveal similarities in role structures in a group of people from the relations between those people. So what this does in effect is it rearranges the underlying um, sociometrics which is the way in which the data is um, you know, organized in such a way that you ultimately get a predefined number of clusters. Uh, and those clusters contain structurally similar social roles. And they are only identified on the basis of the existence or non-existence of observed relations. So in that sense, what this method does, it, it groups together individuals that are similar in the kind of acknowledgements relations in our network that they have to others. Um, so this is, uh, um, we think, a way to, to actually get better at, uh, at the characterization of these different kinds of roles that we find in, in, you know, in a community. So this is the result in our case. What the algorithm that we use um, identified four different groups, as you can see, that clusters people with structurally similar relationships. You don't see all the individuals here listed that uh, are part of the networks just for visualization purposes, but you see the most important ones. And this sociometrics now represents each individual in, an, in the network that uh, in our network by a row and a corresponding column. So that self-directed ties fall onto the, um, onto the diagonal, okay? And elements of, of this square matrix indicate whether or not any two nodes are connected. And you the strength of that connection is identified by the value that you see in these little squares. So the numbers in the square signal the number of acknowledgements from one person to another, and the dark squares are acknowledgements in papers that also reference the theory of games and economic behavior. 
Um, and four groups are identified here um, that are separated, uh, as you can see. Um, and the first thing that you can see is that Marshak and Koopmans are in one block together in group one with Hurwitz and Herstein, and that they acknowledge and get acknowledged a lot by people from group two. And in group two, you see mainly uh, people like Aero, Debre, Radna, Simon, who made really important scientific contributions to further develop particularly expected utility theory and thereby fostered its spread. I hypothesize. And what you see here is that the highest acknowledgments activities in papers that also reference the theory of games and economic behavior is between group two and group one. Um, and uh, you see also that Marshak acknowledges a lot of people from group two uh, and is also acknowledged by pe people from group two, but not as much. Um, there's also a lot of, um, you know, within group acknowledgement activity in group one and group two. And you see also asymmetries in acknowledgements between groups. So for example, although many members of uh, the group three and four acknowledge Koopmans and Marshak and Hurwitz, they uh, don't return these acknowledgements. So Marshak primarily acknowledges people from group two um, and, uh, and doesn't care too much about people from group four, uh, three and four. Um, so I'm already out of time. I see that I need a couple of more minutes. I hope that's okay, like two more or three more minutes. So here's three a more, well, three more. Okay, so, three sorry minutes. about that. Here's a, a group a summary of the four groups. Um, you see, group one consists of peop uh, four people: Marsha, Kopp, Mansovit, and Herstein. Um, and you see also what their tenure is, how many, um, you know, how many uh, publications they had, and also how um, many of those publications cite the theory of games and economic behavior. But I think the important thing about this slide is really that group one and group two are central in the early engagement with the theory of games and economic behavior, whereas group three and four, not very much so. And group one and group two were by acknowledgements relationships very closely related to each other. So, now to see, to better understand how this tells us something about the social structure at Coles, in terms of these different groups, you can express this, um, and this, uh, the, this acknowledgement network as an aggregated network that you see here on the left. Um, and this visualizes the connections among the four groups. So you see that there are reflexive ties, that these are these loops that identify groups whose member engaged intensely with each other. The dark and coloring also identify uh, those groups that engage with the theory of games and economic behavior. And what you can see here again is how closely connected group one and group two were, uh, that they acknowledge each other, that um, the group two consists of these scientific leaders who, who adopted the theory of games and economic behavior, whereas group one uh, contains Marshak and uh, Koopmans. And uh, you see also that group one acknowledges a lot of, uh, sorry, gives, um, uh, gives acknowledgements to uh, group four and group, uh, sorry, is acknowledged a lot by group four and group three, which means that Marshak gave feedback on, you know, papers on the of, of uh, uh, that were published in these kinds of groups. And what we want to say here is that um, is this, this shows how um, Marshak by, by, um, by giving in all sorts of ways feedback and you know pushing um, pushing certain ideas would influence the the kind of research that was done in these th three different groups and mainly in group two, um, and it it tells us uh, something about how the relationship between these academic opinion leaders and the scientific leaders can be at an institution. Okay, I really have to wrap up. I'm sorry about that. Um, this is of course, uh, and that's the last slide. Um, thinking about this uh, more in the historical context, you can see also that when you go into the detail, historical details that um, Marshak fostered the exposure of the theory of game, particularly expected utility theory uh, uh, at Coles via, um, you know, uh, informal um, discussion groups, but also organizing, you know, um, certain uh, events, seminars on that. Um, but also, um, it was by way of the, 
the way in which uh, the, the Coast Commission uh, was set up as a social setting, as um, Dupe and Weintraum called it, like the hybrid institution between a university and a national laboratory, where a lot of informal feedback uh, and discussion culture was ongoing so that this kind of influence could have taken place. And Marshak was, of course, finally very fond of expected utility theory because it conformed to proper standards of science. It had a great power of generalization. Uh, he uh, appreciated that it, was, it contained formal concepts or that von neumann morgenstern had presented, um, or provided formal concepts um, that could be then applied to specific concrete problems. And it was, they were also quantifiable. So he appreciated that not only of game theory, but also in particular of expected utility theory. Um, and that with, that with that, I conclude, I think that this, um, this acknowledgement relate this acknowledgement analysis might tell us something about how ad administrative leaders such as Marshak can influence the adoption of um, of new ideas um, via their the, the kind of role they take at an institution. I'm sorry for going out of, over time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just so we're going to. Uh, continue with uh, with that remarkable uh, com community of scholars, the Coles Commission, but we're taking it in reverse chronological order because having now looked at how the Coles community uh, provided a uh, network of the for discussion of game theory uh, from 1944 onwards. We're going to look at the less less well known earlier period of the uh, Coles Commission. We're going to look at its origins. And while there's been a lot of attention to the Coles Commission at the University of Chicago and then the Coles Foundation uh, at the uh, at Yale University, uh, there has been le rather less attention to the earlier period of the Coles uh, Commission when it was in Colorado, because it originated in Colorado. And there, it, there were a remarkable series of summer research uh, conferences from 1935 to 1940 uh, that uh, had a crucial role in creating a community for mathematical economics and for econometrics. Um, Kasson was looking at how that community functioned uh, as a community for mathematical economics after the publication of von Neumann Morgan's theory of games and economic behavior after World War II. But there's an interesting question of how such a community came into existence uh, in the earlier period in the 1930s when mathematical economics and uh, econometrics was very far from being uh, as in the mainstream of the economics uh, profession. So the Coles Commission for Research in Economics, it held six conferences, each of which is a month long. It's their summer research conferences on economics and statistics. They have them in Colorado Springs from 1935 to 1940, months long conferences. And together it was the very closely related meetings of the Econometric Society uh, these conferences enabled mathematically inclined economic theorists and economic statisticians, groups of people who were then very far from the mainstream of economic theory, and for that matter, uh, far from the mainstream of statistics, where mathematical statistics was not at that point uh, so central in statistics. It enabled these groups of scholars to interact, to receive constructive criticism and not just to receive comments and criticism, but also to experience having a sympathetic audience for their research, which is not something that they would have gotten at the American Economics Association, only not really at the American Statistical Association or the Royal Statistical Society. Uh, it uh, was a very important set of conferences from that point of view. So this paper fits into uh, two larger projects. One is a symposium in Revue d'Economie Politique about the role of seminars, conferences, and workshops in the history of economics, a symposium that actually was published in, uh, already published in October 
because the HES uh, has been rescheduled so often from June of 2020 uh, that uh, instead of presenting a preliminary paper for comments, um, it actually appeared in print be before, uh, before the conference occurred. And the other larger project is I'm writing a history of the Coles Commission and Foundation. Actually, I am uh, sitting at Coles at the moment, uh, communicating with you uh, from there. So this is part of that. Uh, so here is a quotation from uh, Warren Weaver, the director of Natu the Natural Sciences Division of the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, he's speaking in 1937 uh, to the Colorado Springs uh, Gazette while he's uh, at the Coles Conference. Uh, and he uh, says that the Coles Commission provides a meeting place for the leading minds in the field. The average, uh, quite unlike the average uh, scientific uh, gathering, the average scientific gathering is large, and it's impossible for the average speaker to get any get, get across his uh, to any number of people many of his ideas. But with a comparatively small number of scientists here at the conference, it offers a meeting place for scientific minds where much good can be uh, can be accomplished. And after giving this very strong praise of the unique role of the Coles Commission conferences. The Rockefeller Foundation then proceeded to reject the Coles Commission's funding application uh, issue very shortly uh, afterwards. Uh, so the first Coles conference was held immediately following an econometric society meeting in 1935. Uh, so it started as an add-on to the econometric society meet meeting, uh, but it's, the, these conferences soon developed a distinct character. Uh, the nature of the conference, the two conferences, is quite different. They attracted the similar sorts of people, uh, the most mathematically inclined and uh, economic theorists who were concerned with the formalization of economic theory and the uh, more mathematical statisticians involved in economic applications. But the econometric society meetings, they might take say three days, usually over a weekend uh, and you would have more than one session at a time, and maybe you'd have half an hour per paper, including the discussion. It's the same, it's the same sort of format as the conference that we are participating in uh, at this moment. And there'd be a summary in the conference report uh, in Econometric uh, with a paragraph or, or two about each paper. The Coles conferences are different. The conference would run for a whole month. And Normally, there will be one paper a day. At most, there'd be two papers a day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. So you get extended discussion of a paper. So if you have an entire day devoted to each paper, and if people didn't just come into the conference for their own presentation and dis disappear, people stayed in Colorado Springs for the whole months listening to papers, discussing papers, interacting uh, with each other. And then there'd be a publication uh, of an extended abstract of the paper, perhaps three pages uh, summary of each paper. Uh, and so there's a distinctive character of these conferences. And there's also a distinctive feature that these conferences and the Coles Commission and for that matter, uh, the Journal Econometrica and the success of the Econometric Society existed because of the idiosyncratic in research interests of one wealthy individual, Alfred Coles III, uh, Bob Coles, uh, who was the grandson of one of the founders of uh, the Chicago Tribune. And in, he became interested in this uh, in formal application of mathematical and statistical techniques to economic questions because of the 1929 stock market crash. He had been an in, involved in investing his family's money, but also he had an investment counseling firm, Coles and Company, located in Colorado Springs. He'd moved to Colorado uh, when he was recovering from tuberculosis. And then I, as with many people, Alfred Coles became disillusioned in the, after October of 1929 with this 
ability of forecasters to forecast the economy and to forecast the stock market. And he was disillusioned both with the stock market forecasting services to which he subscribed, and he was also disillusioned with the one that he himself provided in the newsletter of Coles and Company. But unlike many people who uh, were hurt by the stock market crash, uh, the Wall Street crash of 1929, Coles, Alfred Coles did not just grumble, he wanted to do something about it. He wanted to demonstrate statistically that stock market forecasters were producing a worthless product, that they did no better than chance. They could not outperform random uh, portfolios. Now, he eventually acknowledged that even if I did my negative surveys every five years or others continued them when I'm gone, it wouldn't matter. People are still going to subscribe to these services. They want the belief that somebody really knows. People want the belief that somebody will, for a thousand dollars, tell you how to make a million dollars instead of going out and making the million dollars themselves. Uh, because if somebody really knew how to beat the stock market, they're not going to tell you how to do it for a small fee. They're going to do it. So uh, what Coles did in his, his first work, uh, in, which became eventually published in the first volume of Econometrica in 1933, he compared the returns that somebody, that people would have gotten if they'd followed the advice of 24 professional stock market, stock market advisors. And he contrasted this with the returns on 24 random portfolios. He can, had the uh, portfolios constructed. Uh, this ends up being an important contribution to efficient market theory uh, by suggesting, by arguing that uh, forecasters uh, do not do better than chance. It turns out to have a later contribution uh, to uh, portfolio theory uh, when uh, Dixon Levens, a uh, statistician working uh, for Alfred Coles at the Coles Commission, who is constructing random portfolios when Coles redoes this study for Econometric in 1944, notices that the random portfolios that are more diver diversified uh, had, uh, had a smaller variance uh, in their returns. So this is in a period when before World War I, when you get very limited government funding of scientific research, with an exception for funding of agricultural research and agricultural extension services, uh, because farmers have uh, considerable influence in elections. It's a period when one, a single wealthy individual could accelerate the development of a scientific discipline where one person's interests could actually matter. So the role of Alfred Coles is comparable, I think, to the role of Alfred Lee Loomis, who's been described as the last of the gentleman scientists uh, who ran his Alfred Lee Loomis laboratory uh, at Tuxedo Park and was in, very important in privately supporting research in physics in the United States in the 1930s, uh, Alfred Coles had a similar influence. Uh, but how is he going to have this influence? He had an interest in trying to prove statistically that stock market forecasting services were worthless, that stock market forecasters could not uh, forecast the, mar uh, the market. And he, turned for advice on using multiple correlation analysis in his studies to a, man, to a mathematics professor uh, from Indiana University named Harold uh, Thayer Davis, who spent his summers in Colorado Springs. And uh, Davis told Coles about a new organization, the Econometric Society, that had been set up on the last day of 1930. Uh, to uh, support the use of formal methods in uh, economics. Uh, and Coles uh, got in touch with the 
pres founding president of the Econometric Society, uh, Irving, Irving Fisher, uh, to offer to support this, uh, this organization. Now, Cole, Alfred Coles must have been an extraordinarily tactful man because the one thing that everybody knows about Irving Fisher, that every, even if they're not economists, is Irving Fisher could not forecast the stock market, even though he thought he could. The single most famous thing ever said by an economist is Irving Fisher saying that stock market prices appear to have reached a permanently high, high plateau. And he said this repeatedly just before stock market prices fell off that plateau and decreased by 85%. Nonetheless, Coles managed not to offend Fisher when, when advancing a research program bent based on showing that stock market forecasters uh, could not forecast the market. And so he offers the Econometric Society to fund the labor a research laboratory, to fund the journal, promises them a minimum of $12,000 a year. And because this is, he's offering this in the depths of the depression to an organization that has 23, I think $23.18 in assets. Other people associated with the Econometric Society like Francois de Vizia are sure that this is just a crank letter. Nobody is going to be offering large sums of money out of the blue in the, in the depression. But Fisher says, even though he's only met Alfred Coles once, and, because Coles was Yale, had studied at Yale, but not in uh, economics, Fisher had known Coles' father and uncle, not just as fellow undergraduates in the 1880s, but more importantly, in, as fellow members of Skull and Bones. So the Cambridge Apostles are not the only secret society of undergraduates who have an effect on the history of economics. The Skull and Bones connection leads to Alfred Cole's funding offer being accepted. First, they, the people in the Econometric kind of Society sent Ragnar Frisch out to Colorado for a week to confirm that the uh, Coles is not nuts. Uh, so the Coles, the Coles Commission in Chicago, uh, not, that's not 19, 1945, that's autocorrect, it's uh, 1955. Uh, and some very well-known post-war conferences, 1945 Conference on Statistical Inference, 1949 Conference on Activity Analysis. But the Colorado uh, college conferences are less well-known, but they're quite notable. Starts was holding an Econometric Society conference uh, at in uh, 1935. Now, Econometric Society conferences have grown somewhat. They, you no longer have the Econometric Society attracting just eight speakers, four of them from the Coles Commission. The others were, it, it was Hotel, Harold Hotelling, Vasily Leontiev, uh, Nikola Georgesco Rogan. And then it's followed immediately by a Coles Commission conference, eight papers by seven speakers, uh, including Hot, uh, Hotelling and August Lush. So this is noteworthy as the, in terms of uh, economics and location, this is the only time when Hotelling would have met Lush. Uh, the, uh, 1936 conference, though, lasts a month. It's got 37 talks, usually one talk per day. Uh, it's got a substantial number of out-of-town uh, out, uh, speakers. The conferences became very well known for Alfred Cole's lavish uh, hospitality of uh, trips to the mountains, uh, picnics, uh, lavish food and wine. However, for 50 years after he was at the 1940 conference, Paul Samuelson was still complaining that he heard these really great reports of Alfred Cole's uh, food and wine that was served at these conferences. But when Samuelson was there, the guest of honor at the dinners was Irving Fisher, a prohibitionist and near vegetarian. And the food and drink was unfortunately the kind that Fisher would approve of, not Samuelson. And Paul Samuelson complained about this for the next 50 years. Uh, so the number of speakers uh, keeps increasing. Uh, you get 20, 26, uh, up to 37. 
mostly male, but there are just a very, very few uh, women, Margaret Joseph, Hilda Gehring, Fritz Van Dyck, uh, much like the American Economics Association meetings, which uh, were very thoroughly male, even though uh, the, uh, there's a substantial proportion of women among new economics PhDs in the United States. Uh, there's a substantial uh, uh, attendance uh, by 1939. You've got 122 local participants and 100 from elsewhere in the in the country, in the U.S. Uh, 12 uh, uh, from other countries. Um, examples of the what's going on at the conferences. So the 1939 conference. Uh, begins with four days of lectures by Irving Fisher uh, on income in theory and income in practice, uh, well, presenting his uh, he, paper that's going to be, come out in Econometrica, uh, arguing for a expenditure tax instead of an income tax, and it also public lecture on the depression. Then you, and also there's three uh, papers presented the other great Fisher, uh, R. A. Fisher, uh, the uh, the probability theorist and statistician on probability theory. You have Cor uh, Corrado Gini giving a public lecture and two papers. One of which is the paper is uh, the presenting the Gini coefficient for measuring uh, the co uh, the concentration of wealth. You've got Walter Schuert of Bell Labs uh, talking about the use of the laws of chance in industrial development. Uh, you have people attending, like uh, the younger Carl Mem Menger. K Carl was a K rather than his father. The, the son of Carl was a C. Uh, the one who had held the famous mathematical colloquium in Vienna, where pioneering work on general equilibrium was presented by von Neumann and Bald. Menger had moved on to the Illinois Institute of Technology and spoke at the 1937 conference. Uh, Yekka uh, before he's moved to the United States, before he uh, eventually becomes, of course, director of Coles in 1943, but when he's still uh, in Oxford as the founding director of the Oxford Institute of Statistics, uh, he came and gave two papers at the 1937 Coles Conference, two at the 1939 Conference, and after the 1937 Conference, he would have become the director of Coles. He would have become director of Coles from 1938 instead of 1943, if only the Rockefeller Foundation had approved that, uh, that grant application. Uh, notable uh, speakers, you look at the 1937 conference, you've got Robert Griffin uh, giving uh, a paper that's an early version of uh, his book, the next year on monopolistic competition and general equilibrium theory. You've got Mordecai Ezekiel talking about Keynes versus Chamberlain. Uh, that is uh, about Keynesian macroeconomics as the, opposed to Chamberlain's monopolistic competition as an explanation for uh, economies producing below potential output. Abba Lerner from London School of Economics uh, gives the very first presentation of his functional finance to an audience that includes Mordecai Ezekiel, Marshak, uh, Charles Roos, uh, Garrett Tintner, Robert Triffin, uh, uh, Abraham Wald, Theodore and Kema. Uh, you've got, uh, in 1940, you've got Wald, you get that W. Edward Deming on uh, sampling theory, Leontiev uh, presenting its input output model in the morning, and in the afternoon is a grad student named Paul Samuelson giving his paper on stability of equilibrium. Uh, so that's the Friday, the next Monday, you've got uh, Irving Fisher in the morning on the velocity of circulation and Trick de Havelmo in the afternoon on the problem of testing economic theories uh, by passive observations. So in a period, in an era of uh, limited, limited, very limited government funding of uh, research, and in a period when mathematical economics was quite far from the mainstream of economics, Alfred Coles managed to cre create a space for mathematical economists and econometricians to interact, uh, to share ideas in months long conferences with one paper a day or at most two papers a day, rather than short presentations over 
a weekend. So thank you very much. And now uh, the floor is uh, open for, uh, for comments, uh, questions about all the papers. Uh, raise a hand. Uh, we, we, using the reactions function to uh, to say something. And unmute yourself when you're ready. Catherine. I think Nicola was first, so okay, please go ahead, Nicola. No, 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 please. No, no, please, please, I've talked a lot. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Nicola first and Catherine. My question was very simple. It was for Catherine. Uh, if you, did you try to 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 cross check your your analysis by looking uh, at the use of some specific tool? Because as as far as I can see, the the, the diffusion of, of of the TGB. And among among people at the Cal, at the Cal's Commission was even more about the use of tools of mathematical tools to say some 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 topology convex analysis uh, hyperplane and so on and so forth uh, then even more than expected utility so um, if I if I had to make a sort of ranking I would put tools first expected utility second and and game theory maybe third or fourth uh, or game theory specifically in, in von Neumann and Morgenstern terms so, so not 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 the as you said the notion of rationality underlying von Neumann's game game theory but just game theory uh, you know trying to design games find solution concepts and so on and so forth but first of all I would focus on tools so maybe you could look even at some random couple of, of some random, you know, cross relations between uh, an, acknowledging uh, so someone, acknowledging someone else, and see if they use the same kind of tools in some papers that they wrote at the time when, when being involved with cults. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a great question. So, um, in fact, it is very hard to go into the content uh, of those papers. Um, so I said this is really preliminary. We are at the first stage with this. And it's difficult to go into the content just because, you know, um, we would have to go there manually. So these are, you know, this is very hard to actually extract something. You cannot even look for the, you know, search with a search function for some words or something. So in that sense, you would probably use some need to use some kind of machine learning techniques to scrap you know certain things in order to say something more systematic about that but i think you're completely right the only thing that i can say at this point is that when you look at these different groups so for example group uh, two you really have people like um you know the bro radna simon markovitz who who are well known for having been engaged with expected utility theory uh, in the first place. So in that sense, I, I totally agree. And the, the, this is very superficial at this point, but at least we have some indication that this, where, the, there, what, where there was this, uh, where there was a lot of engagement with these two groups, group one and group two, that group two consisted really of people who, who published on that and made contributions on that, or Chernoff, Milner, of course, where we know, they were not directly at the call, um, you know, um, they were, of course, making contributions to the axiomatic, uh, to improvement of the axiomatic formulation of expected utility. So in that sense, you're right, we have to look further, but the first indication might uh, support the hypothesis um, in, in that sense. Um, yeah, thanks. I hope that answered the question. Okay, Catherine, you then have the floor for your own question and then Ariane after you. Yeah, I had questions for Gianluca, actually. Uh, I thought that was a really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, so I wondered whether you can say a little bit more about the audience um, that Riker was confronted because, um, so you said something about that. You said that he was critical of these two kinds of methods like case study methodology and um, I think you, intellectual uh, political theory or something as you call it. Um, and I wonder whether, 
uh, except from those few people that you mentioned who are also using economic tools, I would say, in political science, uh, whether he was alone, you know, uh, and, and what kind of audience he, he confronted. And the reason for I'm asking this is because when you read this book, it seems as if most of it is rhetoric to convince people, really convince people verbally that this is the great way to go. And, uh, and so it sounds more like a, like a, a, a piece of, of um, conv you know, I want to convert the others. Um, that was my first uh, question. And the second question is, I wonder, there is this 1959 uh, paper, sorry, on where he tested um, Shubley, uh, uh, Shapley and um, uh, Shapley, yeah, Shubik. And you didn't cite this in your paper. And I wondered whether you can say a little bit more about that, whether or not this paper actually motivated him to go further and say, well, I'm going to give you this alternative, the size principle, and you can actually make predictions with that. Thank you very much. Okay. No, thank for, um, thank, thanks to you for, for your comments and your questions. Uh, well, um, the first one, uh, the audience, uh, um, as I say, there was uh, the, behavioral, the behavioral evolution in the 50s in political science. And, and I, the behavioralists were not really committed to, a quantita to formal analysis uh, like, uh, like uh, Riker interpreted it. But anyway, uh, they were more committed to a quantitative approach, I would say, that is quite different from the case study, uh, as, uh, as I said, and uh, as you mentioned it, and also the historical, uh, the history of ideas approach, so the, the historicist approach. Anyway, yes, as you noted uh, in, in his work, Riker is trying to convince people about, the, the, about how good is uh, his view of, of political science. And um, I think that it was not so convincing, at, at, at least at the beginning. But after that, it was really able to establish a community, an intellectual community that uh, went uh, further in, uh, on adopting these ideas, these economic ideas and uh, these mathematical formal methods. But uh, returning for the audience, uh, um, it's, it's not really easy to define what the behavioral revolution is because uh, it was a quite an heterogeneous group. Um, um, also, the, 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 the behavioralists uh, were not, uh, uh, I mean, they did not share, uh, uh, for instance, a common manifest or something like that. For instance, I, I, I don't think that I put it in, perhaps, yes, in my paper that Robert Dahl defined the behavioralist simply as those committed to the scientific method, to the scientific outlook in political science. So, but it's not, there is not a real a, 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 a definition. Anyway, um, Riker was, was talking to the people and was, was trying to convince these authors, was trying to convince people that were, were inclined to uh, a, more, a more quantitative analysis with respect to the previous one, to the political science in the 30s or in the 40s, but were not committed to formal, to, to gain theory. Also, uh, this is a point that I try to explain in my paper. Uh, that is, um, Riker was not alone in using gain theory. For instance, in international relations, there were gain theory. Uh, for instance, Morton Kaplan, uh, talk a little bit about gain theory in international relation, focusing on 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 the minimax on the on the on the zero sum games, two person zero sum games. But with the, the main difference in my view between Riker and an author like Kaplan, or also a little bit Thomas Schelling, but the case of Schelling is quite different. Is that Riker was very committed for for Riker gain theory was the the, the, the main hope for a, a, a rational modeling, uh, for a, a genuine science of politics, for, a, for an adequate model of political behavior. In, in the case, for instance, of Kaplan, uh, game theory was a simpler tool, but the theoretical framework of Kaplan's analysis, of Kaplan's analysis was that of system theory. So it was more, uh, more, more different, more general. Uh, it was quite different with respect to the theory of Riker. For the second, the second, the second question, uh, I, I I forgot it. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to 
to take note of it. What was the second? What Just was the role the... of the 1959 paper? Ah, yes, sure. Uh, yes, in, in my paper, I did not explore it. Uh, I I explored it in uh, in the in the chapter in the in the dissertation in the dissert in my dissertation chapter that is based on this paper, but not in my paper. It's an interesting paper because Riker discussed uh, the result of Chaplin Schubik and he tried to empirically validate it. Um, uh, he, what he, I mean, his he, his attempt to to empirically demonstrate to, to empirically. Um, Validate the Chaplin Schubik uh, index uh, is not uh, successful. I mean, uh, Riker used the, some uh, uh, voting rolls from uh, the French uh, National Assembly, uh, I think in 1952 53, but he, he didn't discover that the people, he tried to compute the index, it's quite easy to compute the index, but uh, he did not discover that the people would change uh, their. Uh, their party affiliation uh, in reality raised their, uh, their marginal power. But in any case, so this paper, that paper is interesting because uh, in the theory of political coalition, Riker decided to not, in that paper, Riker advanced also a, a quite bold uh, hypothesis about the, the, the rational, uh, the, 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 the rational behavior in politics, that is the, mas the maximization of power. The paper started with this idea of maximization of power and, it must be noted that maximization of power is not an hypothesis of Chaplin Schubik. They don't talk. They don't. They don't. They do not talk about maximization of power. Uh, but Riker advanced this uh, this bold hypothesis, and they said that okay, people, uh, we cannot show that people uh, try to maximize to maximize power. So he look. He, 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 he went further, and they decide to use uh, the uh, the preference for winning over losing. That is quite different, and. Um, I think that is also the, the, the reason for uh, he decided not, not to use the Shapley, Shapley theory in a, in, a, in a theory of political coalition, but to use a phenomenon Morgenstern. He said that uh, there was not, a, a, I mean, there was not, a, in his view, a theory, a, a theory of coalition that was better than phenomenon Morgenstern, so he decided to rest on it. But Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ariane. Um, very quickly, because we are running out of time. First, uh, to Catherine, I had the same question as Nicola. So it's very inter interesting. And uh, really, I congratulate because your methodology is very solid compared to others. And uh, it's why it's very convic convincing. But you need after to, I think, to, to dig into the papers and uh, to in order to stand completely your, your analysis. But very, very interesting. Well, and uh, uh, I had a question to Bob, but then we will have yeah. a Zoom for further question, I think. But my interest was in the selection of the paper for the conference, for the cold conference, who was selecting and what was the room for the PhD or student, you mentioned Malavo and so on, in this um, conference. Is that a kind of mentoring program or the idea was to disseminate this idea with, with this long uh, conference, one long, one month conference? What was the room for training people through the conference? Well, there are, when they could find someone, a graduate student who is doing something related to uh, econometrics or mathematical economics like Samuelson or Havomo, uh, they, they were certainly uh, brought in as, uh, uh, as, as speakers, uh, generally because they would be working with faculty members who would, would be in, involved. So uh, Frisch was very uh, closely involved at, on the advisory count, council of the uh, Econometric Society, and he would have been responsible uh, for, for the co connection with, with, with Havelmo. Uh, I would believe have the strong impression that ultimately decisions were made by Alfred Coles himself. That uh, though he consulted uh, people like, like Frisch uh, or, or Fisher or the other members uh, of the advisory council or talked to uh, Schumpeter and uh, talked to Charles, Charles, uh, Charles Roos, uh, who was the secretary of the Econometric Society, Ultimately, it was uh, Cole's decision because it was Cole's money. Mm, okay. 
And he had not at this point, he did not until 1955 create any endowments for uh, Cole's foundation. It is every year he put up the money, uh, which was also really the case for the Econometric Society uh, as well as the Coles Commission because he was treasurer of the Econometric Society from 1932. Mm, and really mm. because it all depended on his putting up the money every year, ultimately it was his decision. Okay, that was the point. I knew about the money, but I was um, puzzled by the fact who is selecting who, in fact, and who, but you are answering, okay. Well, it, it, because of the money connection, Coles retained the power to, to decide on all the selection. He, he consulted people like Frisch uh, for yes. advice, yes. but he did not actually seem to share the decision-making with them. Okay, okay. Okay, it's what I wanted to know because I read the letters, some of the letters and so on, but that's not surprising when you have the money, you have the power. Uh, yeah. but... Now it changes, <laughs> and that, that really changes very much once Marshak becomes director yeah. of the Coles Commission. Once, 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 uh, Mar once Marshak becomes mm. director and then Koopmans, they take a much bigger share mm. of, the, of the decision making. Uh, Coles take, Alfred Coles comes to take a much more passive role, but as long as the Coles Commission is in Colorado, mm -mm -mm. Uh, Alfred Coles is actively making the decisions. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Um, we have- could I, uh, could, could I just jump in real quick? Yeah, uh, and, and, and then Catherine after that. Okay, thank you. Real, uh, real quickly, this sounds an awful lot like um, Soros and the Institute for New Economic Thinking, mm -hmm. as far as having that much money thrown at a vision uh, that the money uh, that the sponsor yeah. has. Could you just speculate on, uh, or, or, or where are the obvious differences? Well, the one obvious difference is that Coles, although he has his own research agenda regarding stock market forecasting, does not try to in incline anybody else connected with mathematical economics or econometrics to pursue his own research interests. Once he's being persuaded that uh, formal mathematical and statistical methods are the way to uh, conduct his own research. He's perfectly happy to support the re any other research applying mathematical and statistical methods in economics uh, and finance, even if it has nothing to do with his own research. Whereas I gather, I have the strong impression that Soros has more of more in the way of opinions of what other people should be doing in the sort of economics that he's funding. Uh, I would suspect very much that Soros was influenced by the example of Alfred Coles, was influenced by the example of a single wealthy individual being able to affect the direction of the discipline of economics uh, through uh, his own funding. And of course, Alfred Coles was doing this at a time when even after all adjustments for inflation, it took a lot less money to influence the direction of economic research <laughs> than it did when, when, when George Soros uh, got, got involved in doing so. Thank you. Uh, Catherine. Catherine. Yeah, I see we're running out of time. And also you answered actually my question uh, because I was just, yeah, I was just curious about, you know, how you write this kind of, um, you know, history of the Coles Commission, because it sounded as if the, you, um, it sounded that you appraised Coles quite a bit, and I wondered in which way he influenced, you know, the direction um, in his interests. But you, you have said a lot about that, and, um, uh, you know, we can, of course, follow up in more informal discussions about yeah. this. Now, I should mention to all of Berkel to take took a rather less 
benign view of Alfred Cole's interests and the extent to which Cole's was trying to uh, acquire control over the use of the word econometrics. And, uh, uh, but ultimately, I think Coles was happy to have other people doing other things in mathematical economics and econometrics provided that there was a forum for him to do his own, uh, his own work and, uh, and, 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 and a, a forum uh, to, uh, uh, to present it. And after the move to Chicago and after, especially after Marshak becomes director, Coles ceases to have as central a role in making decisions about what's going to happen at, at the Coles Commission. Uh, while it's in Colorado, even when somebody else has the title of, these, of director, uh, first Bruce and then uh, on an acting basis, Harold Davis, uh, it's still very much Alfred Coles uh, really making the decisions. And in, once they get to Chicago, he's, he's largely steps back from uh, that role, in part because after his father died in 1939, uh, he himself had more in the way of other business interests uh, occupying his time. Um, I thank everyone for taking part in the session, and uh, I hope that uh, next uh, summer we can have be seeing each other in person at the HES in, in, in Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Thanks for thank coming. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank very